Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Holly, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you, dear. Okay. Beautiful morning, isn't it? God smiles on alcoholics if nobody else don't. I was sitting there thinking, I said, now, when I'm with my friends, there's always one little story I like to tell you about because I feel that it fits us perfectly. And at least it does me anyway. There was once a man that had come into our fellowship. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when we get sober, other people get jealous, you know, because they can't use this no more. <laughs> so this man, he was trying his best to practice the principles of the program. And he had another friend that hadn't, well, you know, he was one of those yo-yos in and out, up and down, and all that sort of thing. Thank you, darling. And uh, so, being a little bit jealous, he figured, well, I'm going to get his goat one way or the other. So he lit in on him, and he started talking about his family, and that didn't make the man too much difference. He let him talk. So finally, he talked about his church, and put up with that for a while. He talked about his dog, his cat, everything he could think of. Johnny, you know how it is when people want to get to you. So finally, he hit his Achilles heel. He lit in on him about AA. He said, yeah, and that other thing you belong to. He says, you know, that thing must be like Noah's Ark. He said, "Um, with all those people in there, there's got to be some gossip. <laughs> and he said, uh, none of the reason why it's like Noah's Ark, with all them animals in there, there's got to be some filth. The man looked at him, he said, you're exactly right. He said, AA is, just like Noah's Ark. We've got a little gossip, we've got a little filth, but there's one thing about it. If it stays in, it stays dry, just like Noah's Ark. <laughs> So this morning we're going to try, if we can, with God's help, to go one point beyond staying dry. We want to be sober. Now the big book tells us our stories reveal, in a general way, what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. Well, I could stand here all morning telling you what I used to be like. But that, to continue to give you a drunkologue, as Shakespeare would put it, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. <laughs> because everybody in here knows how to get drunk. All you got to do is open your mouth and swallow. <laughs> but on the other hand, to let you know that I belong... There's another thing. You, you know, it's a known fact. I've been around a day or two. And there's not something wrong with you. When you come in, they will if you stay. Well, there's going to be something wrong. Something one way or the other. You're going to dig up some care. If you don't dig up your character defects, your brothers will. You know, in fact, got them all down. So I will start with a little bit what I used to be like. But telling you, I had my first drink when I was about 14 years old. At all. You know, lots of times we like to think that um, old poor so-and-so fell into his bad company. You know, your parents feel good or other people feel good and say, well, you know, it's not his or her fault. They fell in with bad company. (laughs) (laughs) Well, anybody that fell in with me fell in with bad company. (laughs) I was real right for the deal. (laughs) I remember at home, my grandparents were teetotalists in a certain sense. But, you know, I'd been in AA for a long time before I found out that about all of my aunts and uncles were alcoholics or drunkards or something was wrong with them. But for a long time, you know, I thought, oh, my gracious, no alcoholics in my family until I started taking their inventory and I found out oh, something was wrong. Well, nevertheless, my grandfather, who had arthritis, I suppose, or rheumatism or whatever it is, you know, he had an old bottle of whiskey there, and he ruined it by putting in a whole lot of herbs and old rock candy and crap like that. And um, he had it in the drawer, and when the weather was bad and his leg hurt him, he'd come crippling in there, you know, and open that drawer and take two, three swigs out of it and sit there and rub his leg, and then he would walk away. <laughs> so I thought I ought to try that. I didn't have 
have arthritis then. <laughs> I switched in there one day, you know, and I took more than two or three swigs out of it. And I crippled away. <laughs> but there was something about it. All of my life, you know, I never felt that I could measure up to other people. I, You know, I had an inferior way of showing my superiority. <laughs> You know, I never could reach that common level, you know, where you're no better than nobody else and no worse than nobody else. One day you feel better than everybody else, and the next day you feel, you know, lower than a uh, whale, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> Nevertheless. And that was the beginning of it. That was the beginning of my journey into alcohol. And I'm not going to give you a blah, blah, blah description of it, because I'm sure that most of you know what it means to wake up and the clock says six, and you don't know what six is talking about. It just says six. And it's kind of a twilight outside, and uh, you get up to go to the bathroom. Somebody says, are you just coming in or are you going out? So you lay there, and you just don't get a drink of water. And finally, you got to go. You want to want, you want a drink of water first. Then you want to go to the bathroom, and they're going to ask you the same stupid thing. So you lay there and suffer at both ends. You don't go anywhere. <laughs> I know all about that. I don't know whether you know anything about pawn shops or not, but I do. I had a watch that stayed in the pawn shop so much it wouldn't run on a Jewish holiday. <laughs> well, the thing about this watch was this watch was a present that was given to me by a man I dearly loved. Oh, I love that man. And he'd given me this watch, but you know, I pawned that watch for a man that I loved better, old Taylor. You know? <laughs> and I was sick with my man for a long time. <laughs> and then as time went on, you know, there's sometimes that we might hear in this fellowship, oh, I never drank anything but this. I never drank anything but the very best, you know, you hear all that kind of stuff. But see, I attended bar for a number of years. I know what you drink. You know? <laughs> when... When you get drunk, you drink anything that pours. I know that, see. I know all about that, see. And, uh, and that's what happened to me. Before I came into this fellowship, before I found it, rather, I had my dear old namesake. <laughs> I call it my namesake. It wasn't it, but I called it that anyway. You know, they say women are not wine old. Well, why not? <laughs> so, that's what I was when I came into the fellowship. A full-blown, full-grown wine it. You know, while I love sweet Lucy. She's the only gal I work for all day long, and she with me every night. But I, oh, how I loved her. And then it went on for a number of years, more than I care to recall this morning. But finally, something happened. As the big book says, what we used to be like and what happened. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I never get tired of telling you what happened, because this was a sure hand of God what happened to me. You know, to the gentleman that read there. Probably no human agency could have relieved re alcoholism, but God could and would if he was sought. But, you know, I was always afraid to pray to God about my drinking, you know. Because I figured, you know, he wouldn't be interested in nobody getting drunk and those kind of things. And then I was always brought up like this. Change your ways and do good and then pray. Well, I don't see no sense in praying if you can do all this by yourself, you know. <laughs> And, and and so I used to pray to the saints and tell them, don't tell God what I said. <laughs> well, I was going to sneak into heaven the back door or something like that. I don't know. But, but I tell you, <laughs> you know, uh, they found out who I was when I got there. St. Peter would have smelt my breath long before I got there. He never let me in. But I remember the miracle started for me on a Saturday night. I was sitting in my kitchen there with my bottle of sweet Lucy. And this is the beginning of a miracle because it happened on Saturday night and rarely was I ever home on Saturday night, let alone being alone. <laughs> and the uh, story came on over the radio. And this story was about a woman that had a drinking problem. Now, if it had been about a man that had a drinking problem, I wouldn't pay any attention to it. All the men I knew had problems. If they knew me, they had a problem. <laughs> Well, nevertheless, I, to this day, I don't remember any of the ingredients of that story whatsoever. All I know is the story was called The Glass Crutch. It was about this lady that had a drinking problem, and I thought right then and there, if she just quit drinking whiskey and just some wine, she wouldn't have any problems. <laughs> and it said, if you ever need our number, we'd be the first one in the phone book. Well, I thought, that's a lie. You know, six or seven years 
prior to my coming in to that to this fellowship. That story stayed on my mind. Now, it didn't stay on my mind every day, nor every month, or every week, but at certain intervals it would come to me the words of the glass crust. And I did not for the life of me could I figure out what it meant. But what could it mean, the glass crutch? Okay. I remember walking down the street. It seems that the heel place on my shoes would beat out the words, the glass crutch. It seems that the clock said, didn't say tick-tock, it said the glass crutch, the glass crutch. <laughs> Finally, one day, I was sitting there in the living room, I suppose, trying to read a newspaper. And it seemed as if every word on that newspaper said the glass crutch. And I said, my Lord, what is this? And it dawned on me then exactly what it is, you know. You see, when the time is ripe, you'll be ready. You know? If you ain't ready, you will get ripe, one way or the other. <laughs> Works like that. Now, it would sound dramatic to say I ran to the phone book immediately and looked up that number, but I didn't do nothing like that. I think there's anything wrong with me, I'll fix it. I'd fix everybody else. Why couldn't that fix me? Well, nevertheless, I finally did go to the phone, and I, being a pathological liar, as well as a drunkard, I told the lady, I said, it was right there in the phone book. The first number, they said it was to be there, and it was. It was right there. And I called this lady up, and I said, um, I got a friend out here. I said, I think she's losing her mind. <laughs> would, uh, you send somebody out to talk to her, and the lady said, would you like to have somebody talk to you? I said, no. <laughs> Not me. Finally, I straightened the situation out, and I called again. And she said uh, she'd have someone call me in a short time, and this lady did call me. And, you know, I've always been a very obedient person. This woman, when she called me, she said, Now, if you've got anything out there to drink, you get rid of it. I did. I drank it up. <laughs> and, uh, so, you see, I started out in this program being obedient. <laughs> see, I believe in obedience. <laughs> so, here, finally, the lady did come out there. See, but now I had reached the stage of zombies. And you ever been like a zombie? If you drink, you don't get drunk. And if you don't drink, you don't get sober. You're just a zombie. That's me. But alcohol is everything the big book says it is, cunning, baffling, and powerful. But just about a few minutes or a short time before I went to that first meeting, a couple of lushy buddies of mine came by there, and they gave me a couple of drinks, and it just woke up this alcohol, you know? Have you ever got in the morning and took a cold drink and got drunk all over again? Well, that's exactly I heard a lot of mm hmm so, I think you can identify with me. See, I didn't get this out of no book. I got this out of the gutter, you know? So anyway, I of the bottle. And wherever the bottle was, that's where I was. Well, and, well, nevertheless, you know that lady took me to that meeting anyway? And I don't remember too much that happened at the meeting. Only the three other gals jumped up and said, we're going to help you with it. They thought I was going to gonna be my pallbearers, I guess. I was <laughs> There's one thing that woman said to me, I shall never forget the longest day I live. At that time, I had two children. And, um, well, I had a husband, you know. Somewhere around there, but no, I put him out there, and that's right. Well, nevertheless, uh, I said, um, I've got to do something on the count of these children. And that woman said the magic words to me, and I haven't, if she never said anything else, and if I never learned anything else, this is one of the things I will never forget. She says, You've got to do this for yourself. That did it. You, you see, people are always telling people, you know, oh, what you're doing to so-and-so. Oh, look what you're doing to your job. Look what you're doing to dear mother, dear so Fido, or anybody else. Look what you're doing to you. And then we come in the program and they tell us we're the most important person here. Sure, if I get myself straightened up, conscientious as most alcoholics are, they'll straighten up other things. Sure. Yes, we have to bring other things to their attention, but isn't it nice to bring it to yourself first and foremost? See? So that's where the problem lies with me. Okay. Well, the response is a little bit different than they did. Nowadays, you know, now they give you a card and tell you where the meetings are and pick you up there later, you know. They didn't do that then. They didn't say, would you like to go to a meeting tonight? Nobody said that. They said, get your ass ready, I'll be by for you. <laughs> and that's what happened. So, and you went, you know. So, now you went to the meeting, and that's all the was to it. You went there, and I kept going there, and I kept going there. There's one thing, you know, I was thinking about the other day. And I don't think I've ever mentioned it before. But something, one day, one morning, I shall never forget it. Was that a morning meeting? Someone, uh, you know, I thought that these people had read out the big book when they read chapter five. I just thought, well, I'll never be able to do that. And they never asked me anyway. One of the greatest things that ever happened to me in my life. Now, I don't say when a new person comes in immediately making chairman or making treasure. Don't do that as making chairman. Treasure. But somebody handed me the big book and said, Holly, would you read chapter 5 this morning? 
You know, I could hardly wait till I got home. I told everybody, but you know, they let me read out that book this night. I just knew I was a part of it, and they let me read, you know. But now, as far as talking, I made up my mind I won't say too much. And I've been talking ever since, you know. About things I know about and a lot of things I don't know about. But nevertheless, that, that was the beginning. And I said to my sponsor, I said, um, the one of them, I said, well, what do you do after you've finished the 12 steps? I said, then, then what do you do? She said, well, you, you don't ever finish them, Holly. She said, just uh, think of them as if you're going on a trip. Well, I thought, oh, hell, I've been on enough trips. I, you know. <laughs> and I like to think of these 12 steps as my journey into sobriety. And that's what I'm going to talk about this morning, my journey into sobriety. I, you know, if, if you're going on a journey somewhere, the first thing that you do is to take your car to a reputable mechanic and uh, have him to go over it. You know, most practicing alcoholics think more of their car than they do anybody else anyway or anything else. You know, everything's my car. You want to get his dandruff up, just get his car. I don't care how drunk he is, don't try to take away his keys. Let him have his car. So nevertheless, but when one is going on a journey, the first thing he or she does is get his car in good condition. That's why many times when a person is sponsoring another person, they might tell them, I suggest you go to the doctor. You know, there may be something wrong with you, but maybe you can straighten it out. Because, see, if you don't feel good, you know, you don't hear well. And so it's pretty good to try to feel good. Then the next thing, when one is going on a journey, he, well, he or she will go to AAA or someplace like that and have them to map out a route for them. Now, living in Ann Arbor, if I was going down to Kentucky and I was going to drive, God forbid, uh, <laughs> the first thing they would tell me is to go over to 23 to I-75 and they'd say, now you get on there, I-75 South, and uh, you stay right on there and you can't miss it. You wind up in Kentucky. Well, you know what the big book says? Rarely have we ever seen a person fail at a thoroughly followed our path. In other words, you can't miss it. You know, you stay on there. But, you know, we do like your detour and all that kind of stuff. Now, there is... These 12 steps we will find is our road map. You're going to find it if you stay on them, that's for sure. You know? Now, there's another thing that is of utmost importance as one follows. And that is to obey the signs that you see along the road. So they love to get you in these little country towns if you've, you know abuse one of their stop signs or something like that and uh, take all your vacation money away from you or something. <laughs> so it is well that we obey the signs that we see along the road. Now, the first step that we see, first sign, rather, that we see along the road is a stop sign. That's the sign you see more than you do any other sign, is stop. Yeah. You have never yet seen a sign that says paper off. <laughs> it says stop. And no policeman in the world going to buy that. You know, you just all the side safe enough. And hence it is with that first step of our program, where we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, and our lives become unmanageable, you know. It tells us there are halfway measures of ill nothing. Stop. Right then and there, you know. In other words, what are some of the stop signs that I ran through? I can't tell you all of them. Time is too short. Some of the signs that I know I should have stopped. But, you know, like everybody else, you know, I think I can beat that light. I think I can beat it. Yeah. And run right into the arms of the man every time you think he's going to beat something. When one has to steal from himself, yeah, he needs to stop. Yeah. When one has to lie to himself, he needs to stop. Then you go out and work all day long and spend your own money and bring home some whiskey and hide it. And it isn't even Christmas time. <laughs> it's your whiskey, your house. And you're going to bring something in and hide it, and it ain't nowhere near Christmas, but you're hiding things already. <laughs> and, and, and somebody will say, just lying, bit. what is that doing over there? I don't know. <laughs> Not only would you bring it in there and hide it, and then lie about it, and it's in your own house. So I need it to stop. And then justify. Oh, baby, I could justify every drink I ever took in my life, you know? Rationalization was the thing. And you know, a friend of mine, somewhere down in the South, I can't remember where, he told me about rationalization. I'm going to tell it to you. If you don't like me for saying it, well, it's your bag. <laughs> he said rational, rationalization is just like masturbation. You're screwing yourself. <laughs> yeah, I knew you 
wouldn't like that. <laughs> and then we become, I uh, become preoccupied with drinking. I mean, I was really and truly, you know, you might have started out, I needed to stop. You might have started out, you know, so I would say, uh, I'm oh, just drinking all weekends. Well, what kind of But you're preoccupied. You can hardly wait till Friday comes so you name Thursday Friday. <laughs> and then you, you say, well, you know, uh, I, I told that lie. I never drank before five, but I never told you what five. You know, what five it was. I never drank before five o'clock. So then after all, it's too long to wait till Thursday. So then it begins a daily deal there with me. And not only a daily deal, then you, I knew I needed to stop. <laughs> when you get up in the morning and have to reach for a drink. Now, something is going wrong. See, my guy will scare the daylight out of a person. The figure you got to get a drink time you get up in the morning. And one of the things that I have often thought about that I used to say, I got to have me a drink. I got to have a drink. Say, anytime you got to have one, you don't need one. You know? say, when I got to have a drink or I need a drink, there's a difference in saying, I'd like to have a drink or I'll have a drink. But I gotta have me a drink. No, I need me a drink. Yeah. Well, if I'd have had a drink, I'd have sure told so and so off. <laughs> yeah. And then this old deal of anxiety. Oh, I love to put that in other people. You know how you you come home and you didn't want to be home, but you and uh, but after you got in, you want to get back out, but you don't know how to get back out. <laughs> you're just walking on out. No, you got to upset everybody. <laughs> So you start walking up and down, walking up and down. Instead of just saying, I'm going out for a while. Oh, no. See, we got to have an excuse for everything. So I walk up and down till finally somebody says, what's the matter with you? I say, what are you picking on me for? <laughs> and then they'll finally say the magic words, I wish you'd get out of here. That's all you want to hear. <laughs> That's all I want to hear is to get out. So, see, putting me out of my own house. <laughs> Now, you know, I needed to stop, but I kept right on saying, lying, stealing, and then gulping. You know, you get to that point where you got to gulp a drink. I mean, when I say gulp, I mean gulp, too. You know, you have a little light party there at the house, and you go outside, you go out in the kitchen there, and, uh, you know, you pour everybody one of them little drinks and one of them little insult glasses, about like that. <laughs> and uh, I give me a gratitude glass. But before that, I have to gulp it down. And you go up to down so quick that tears are running out of your eyes. And you come back in and you lie. You say, oh, my hay fever. Sorry. <laughs> so, you know, you go up to down and went up your nose or someplace. Else. I know all about it. You know, one of those kind of things. I needed to stop. Finally, that day come where I could admit it. Say, but that wasn't enough. I had to accept what I had admitted. You know, see, I admitted to a lot of things to get people off of my back. You know, I tell you, yeah. If you say that I walk like an elephant, yes, I believe it. Mm -hmm. Anything you say, I'm gonna say just to get you off of my back. But we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol. That our lives become unmanageable. I admitted it, and then the next thing I had to do was accept what I admitted. No, no more lying about it. And as we travel on our journey into sobriety, we see a sign in the road that says yield. No. Came to believe the power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Yeah. In other words, that's telling me, look, you better give up before you give out. You know? In other words, yield. I've now got to the place where I needed something stronger. Yes. Have you ever said to yourself, you know, I'm not going to get drunk tonight if you weren't a beer drinker. So I'm just going to drink beer or something like that, you know, because I don't want to get drunk. Mm -hmm. So you sit there and you drink this beer and you get paralyzed in the knees or something drinking it. Beer. And finally, as time goes on, you know, you just feel stupid. You don't feel like you want to feel. And you finally say to the barkeep, hey man, give me something stronger than this stuff here. Yeah? Then you're on the road, aren't you? So hence it is, when I came into the fellowship, I found out that I had to have something stronger. Many people might tell you today, or if you haven't heard it, stay around long enough, you will. Say, well, you know, I just don't have any faith in that God bit. I, you know, I, I just don't buy that God bit. Well, it's not for sale. If it did, everybody in here would be on the welfare. It isn't for sale. <laughs> so there are things. So I must yield to something. Say, because that book says that God could and would if he was sought. So I must put my faith and something outside myself. 
Because always I had lied to me. Always. Anybody else that would listen as far as that's concerned. But sure, I have nothing against doctors. Not too much against psychiatrists. Some of them I know. Just, if there's any in the room present company except that. As long as I left them. All right, you know, I mean, I don't have nothing against people. Not anymore. But, but there are many people that may feel that, well, you know, I don't need this God bit because, you know, after all, I go to my psychiatrist and I go to my doctor, so I, I don't need AA. And I don't need this God bit. Well, now let's look at it like this. We do sometimes need both elements. Uh, let us look at Humpty Dumpty there. You know, uh, this cat was crazy. Yeah. In other words, all good doctors work like a horse. Good doctors do. And most psychiatrists, you know, are the king's men. They got their nose stuck up in the air many times. So you remember that Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. Why? See, the good doctors, being the king's horses, psychiatrists being the king's men, they're only aid to the king. So you just simply cannot build a bridge across the king's nose. Mm -hmm. Now, if Humpty Dumpty had called on the king, as long as, as long as in, with the aid, you know, that cat might have, that egg might have got put back together again. <laughs> but you see, one must. You say, oh, now there's no must in the big book, then you must read it. Because <laughs> there's some in there. I got one book where I went through and lying around every one of them. They're in there, you know. But, okay. So when one seeks help beyond the realm of himself, he comes to believe in a power greater than himself that can restore him to sanity. Sane of thinking. I oftentimes think of Humpty Dumpty. That it's the necessity for me to call on a power outside of myself. And if I call on this power outside of myself, it becomes such a power that is within myself, you know, that he dwells with me, and I with him. Because I could not make it. I'm not telling other people you've got to do what I do, but I'm going to tell you one thing. I like the idea of telling you what is suggested in the big book, and it is suggested in the big book. Now, this business of yielding, well, you know, it's, it's well to yield. Now, suppose you're driving a Volkswagen here, and um, you see the sign that says yield, and you say, I ain't yielding to nothing. And long around that corner comes a Mack truck. Man, you ain't got a chance. <laughs> you don't have a chance. So, hence it is the necessity of my yielding, regardless of what it's going to be. And then as we travel on, we see a sign in the road that says, Wrong way, do not enter. Made a decision to turn my will and my life over the care of God. See, decision. I've got to look at this word decision. You see, de decision determines one's destiny. And it says, whatever decision I make this morning determines my destiny for today. See. But when I make up my mind and say, well, I think I can do it myself wrong way, do not enter. See. That's it. A decision to turn my will and my life. It's just like a car, you know, your will and your life. You, you, you know, you, you got to have everything in gear before you start out there. Will and life. And then again, we will say, well, you know, I just simply can't trust. How can I turn my will and my life over to things that I can't see? Well, can you trust what you... Did you ever see the wind? No. Nope. But you can feel it. You know? You can see it, but you, you see the results of it, and you can feel the results of it. Mm -hmm. As far as that is concerned, have you ever stood and said, well, I'm going to watch this leaf turn to gold. You see a leaf turn to gold, you know it turns to gold. But you stand out there under one of them trees and say, now I'm going to stand here and watch this leaf turn to gold. I'll guarantee you somebody in a white coat's going to pick you up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it will turn to gold, but you won't see it. Mm -hmm. One can have, as far as that is, you see, it says, over to the care of God. Really, that's what it says. Over to the care of. It didn't say, made you see, well, I turn my will and my life over to God. It says, over to the care of. In other words, that's, that's telling me, you can take it back anytime you want to. Yeah. Over to the care of God. It's just like putting money in the bank. You go down there. Yeah, 
don't give them people your money. You turn it over to the care of the bank. Yeah. So you got a checking account. All right. You've got to write something in that book and you turn it over there to the lady. And you don't keep going back all day long and say, hey, you still got my money? <laughs> you turn that money over to them people and, you know, you lower it and get them around it, you know. And then write it down in the book. And, you know, if you got a savings account there, the longer you leave it in, the more interest you're going to draw. But if you back there for 15 minutes and you got a savings account, you're not going to draw any interest. That is why sometimes when things go rough, when we've got days that got to go rough and got to get tough, maybe we can live off of that interest, you know? Because I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, and this morning I'm standing here on the interest because it's there. I put it there, and I know it's there. Care of. So God is not my garbage pail. You know, oh, I, well, you know, I made decisions to turn my will and my life over to God. You know, anything comes along wrong, they just, just dump it on him like that. It don't work like that. Over to the care of. See, free will is the only thing that I really have that I can give God is my free will. See, you don't give alcohol your free will. It takes your free will. It don't ask you. Alcohol says if you're going to play on my league, baby, you do it my way. When I get down on my knees at night to pray to God and in the morning, I can get up. Alcohol has knocked me down a minute time and said, you better not get up. <laughs> and every time I'd try to get up, that other knee would flip off from under me. You know? Uh-uh. Alcohol says, okay, you play on my league. You don't have to give me your self-respect. I demand it, and I'm going to take it. And it does. Say, restored to sanity. When one is restored to sanity, he is restored to a certain amount of his self-respect. You ever see a self-respecting drunk? Mm-hmm. You say, yeah, I'm a self-respecting old baloney. No, Mm-mm. no. no. Wrong way, do not enter when I feel that this is something that I can do all by myself. No, no. As we travel on our journey into the Briary, we see a sign in the road that says, A road under construction. That's where we made a searching and fearless mall inventory of ourselves. Yeah. Now, why is the road under construction? Well, the main purpose is so that you and I can travel safely. That is why one makes an inventory, searching and fearless mall inventory of himself. So I can travel safely. I don't want to come in contact with some of these things that I have come in contact. And if I have, I want to know how to handle them, how to cope with them with God's help. Now, what are some of the things that constitutes the road being under construction? Sometimes there's holes in the road, and uh, which tells me that there's something missing. Yeah. There's holes in my life. There was something missing. And it needed to be filled with something. Now, when there's a hole out there in the road, they just simply don't go out there, shall we say, and fill it with ashes. They have to fill it with something that is substantial. And hence the holes, those empty spaces in my life, that loneliness and whatnot and all those things that go along with it, has to be filled with something. Something that is substantial. And I don't know what kind of winners. Well, I do know. You have a bad winner just like we do. Many times when the road is in a terrible condition, there's great amounts of salt that's poured on the road, and salt has a way of eating away at the road. And I like to look at this salt as resentment. Because you talking about resentment, eating away, eating away. But you know, if you want to tell the truth about resentment, Alanons resent alcoholics just hate. That's really hate. Pure D, unadulterated, under. You know, I didn't know what the word. I never heard of the word resentment until I come into AA. You know, I thought it was some kind of spaghetti or something. You know, resentment. I was so full of hate. I didn't know nothing about resentment. I hated everybody up to and including me. You know, what I'm but anyway, it had eat away at me and left me in one horrendous condition. Say, road under construction. I had to do something about that. Say, what did I do about it? Say, I prayed. I prayed. See, this is one time you can't fake it till you make it. 
You know, yeah, well, you can fake it to you. People, don't try it with alcoholics, because we know when you're faking it. You know, yeah. now, you might try it on some of them, you know, people out there. But uh, not, you say, well, you can always fake it to you. Not with another alcoholic, you can't fake it, because he'll tell you, baby, you're coming down wrong. <laughs> you know, there you are. Then there are many parts of the city you will see signs that where heavy trucks are not permitted to go because of the pressure that these heavy trucks place on the road. And I look at the pressures that I put on myself, and I blamed other people. Oh, I love to tell people about the pressure that was on me. I just love to tell you about it, Jim. Yeah. It was poor dear Holly with two children to raise, you know, all by herself. When those come in, I had so much pressure on me. Oh, yes. And then on top of that, I, too, was an orphan for a chaser and all that kind of stuff. Oh, man, I had so... I loved it. So the more pressure I had on me, the more excuse I had to drink, you know. I was always volunteering for something because I love that pressure. Yeah. You all be quiet now. Don't disturb Mama. Too much pressure on my Mama go somewhere curled up drunk in hell. And you know about pressure. You know what I'm saying? Then there's that change of temperature. Many times, the change of temperature can cause when the temperature goes from hot to cold or cold to hot, it causes the road to buckle. And who has any more change of temperature than we have? Sometimes we have it drunk or sober. This change of temperature. Sometimes you have to look in a person's face when you come in, you don't know whether to speak to him or not, you know. Let's see how he's taking it before you say good morning, you know. So you might say good morning. So what did you say that for? <laughs> change of temperature. That was what I was talking about in the very beginning. I never, never knew what slot to fall in. Either too high or too low. Change of temperature. Especially if it was something I didn't want to do, there was a change of temperature. Always. Road under construction. Why, Holly? I found out why. Why are you like this? You want attention. You ever see a drunk, you know, he'll tell five lies in one minute about something. He get over in the corner. Well, I'm going to sit over here by myself. Don't pay no attention. Then he gets up and he starts, he's going to make you see. Yeah. <laughs> tell you don't bother him and you don't bother him. Then he gets mad because you don't bother him and say you're ignoring him. You know, change of temperature. One of those kind of things. He's just like the man, you know, he came home drunk one night, one morning rather, and his wife said to him, she's trying to do everything she could. She said, honey, let me fix you something to eat. I don't want nothing to eat. She said, well, just let me fix you some breakfast. All right. She said, what do you want, dear? I want two eggs. She said, how do you want them? Well, boil one and fry one. <laughs> so she boiled one and she fried one. She brought them out and she handed it to him. He looked at him and said, oh, you boil the wrong one. <laughs> you know, that moral line. My morals won't permit me to do this. So you get drunk enough, baby, you ain't got moral one, you know? <laughs> Alcohol had rubbed out that line. And I cannot blame everything on alcohol. It does not say, made a searching and filled moral inventory of alcohol in me. It says, made a searching and filled moral inventory of ourselves. I take it by the time I take the first step, I'm not supposed to be drinking. A certain, don't lay everything. You see, wait a minute. I had some of this crap in me before I ever took a drink. You know? But by taking a drink, that, just, that was my ally. You remember when you said, if I'd have had a drink, I'd have told so-and-so off? What you're saying in essence, or what I was saying in essence was, I already had that evilness in me, but I was such a coward, I needed a drink to bring it out. Huh? Am I lying? No. Okay. One of those kind of things. That line got rubbed out. So now the line has to be put back in there. It must be. Oh, I was always going around. You know, used to be an old man living next door to me. Bless his heart. He never could drink out of a bottle like nobody else. He always had to pour his whiskey into a mason jar and put and ruin it with putting other things in there. And he'd get drunk, and he'd get so drunk he'd run backwards. And I, and I used to look at that old man. I said, if I ever get like that, I quit. Well, one day. I didn't have any money and nothing to drink, and I found his mason jar, and we ran backwards together. <laughs> so sometimes in making a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, I have to build, with God's help, a new road. Yeah. And now we see a sign that says, slow. Do not fast. Slow. That's a fifth step. Admitted to God, ourselves, another human being, the exact nature 
of a wrong. Slow, do not fast. In other words, I don't have to come in this program and five seconds after I'm in here, I'm going around taking the fifth step. I mean, I haven't done the fourth yet. I haven't done the third. Oh, I have to just take my fifth. <laughs> you know, I had so many fifths already, you don't know what a fifth is anyway, you know. <laughs> just cool it when the time comes when it hurts long enough and strong enough, that's when you'll take it. You'll take the fifth then. Half the time I didn't understand what the fifth meant because to begin with I said I ain't gonna never take no fifth step. Admit to God ourselves and another human being the exact nature of our wrong. Well, what does it mean? The exact nature. My motive. Why did I do what I did? Motive. To do you steal because you were hungry or did you steal because you were greedy? Motive. Say. You know, sometimes we said, oh, so-and-so, he hates his job, he hates his family, he hates his... He didn't hate anybody, he's just scared of responsibility. The exact nature of his wrongs, he's just scared of, to be a man, he's scared to be a woman, scared to face responsibility, was the exact nature. See, I love the whole lot of responsibility. I believe in overdoing it. See, the more the merrier. And then the more things I had to bellyache about. The more things, the more reason, excuse to drink, because all of this poor responsibility is on me. And many times, because I had so much remorse, and I had to look at that in guilt, you know, oh, I get so much remorse, I had to look at that. That remorse I had wasn't nothing but self-pity turned wrong side outwards, that's all it was. And I was calling it remorse, I was just feeling sorry for Holly. Yeah. I wasn't so sorry for what I did as I was sorry because I got caught doing what I did. If somebody else could have done it, you know, that would have been all right. But I got, I was sorry. And finally that day came that I knew what true remorse meant. And I also knew this, that true remorse did not mean that I had to become, shall we say, what is it there, a floor bat for anybody. Because humility wears a cloak of dignity. And dignity shrouds itself in humility. When one can see his wrongs or her wrongs. And as a woman or man enough, a human enough to admit them, see, then one becomes a whole person. See, the exact nature of my wrongs. That's what I had to look at. Then another thing, exact nature. Many times you say, well, I don't know what I did. Well, sometimes it's not what you did, it's what I didn't do. What I did. Motive? Why is it you didn't do it? Fear. I was afraid if I did it, I'd be criticized. Well, I do it now and I get criticized anyway, so it doesn't make any difference, you know. And then, you know, how much can I get away with? See, a drunk will try you. We even try ourselves. How much can I get away with? The exact nature of my wrong was my ego told me at times I was smarter than anybody. The exact nature of my wrong. I knew it all. And the longer I stay in this program, the you know. But I'm honest enough now to admit it. I don't care what you talked about before, I knew all about it. You know. Oh, honey, you know, you go into a bar, I was in, before they even had nuclear physicists, I was one. I knew all about it. <laughs> now as we travel on our journey into sobriety, we see a sign that says detour. Entirely ready to have God remove all the defects of character. Detour. Unless one is built, bent rather, on self-destruction. You know, sometimes we feel that, um, well, I got away with it before. I don't see why I can get, can't get away with it now. I got away with it before. And many times a person will say, uh, we might think I've thought it myself, you know. Well, it didn't make me drunk. I'm still sober. It didn't. I said, you mean to tell me you could do that and you didn't get drunk? Then you wasn't sober to begin with, see, you know. It was dry that day. Sober people don't do those things, Holly. Yeah. Unless one is bent on self-destruction, you know, many times you may be driving along there, you know. As the big book tells us, we thought we could hold on to our old ideas. We thought. It's like the man that's driving down the road and it says, this bridge is washed out here, detour. Oh, I made it before. I can make it this time. Honey, the water may be a little bit higher this time than it was before, yeah? <laughs> Holding on to my old ideas. See, a little show off can cause a great big fall off. I have to watch that sort of thing. And then again, I must detour. This, oh, he's sober now. She's sober now. And oh, isn't he or she ambitious? 
Are you ambitious or just plain greedy? What is it to you? know? I have to learn to live and let live. Well, you know, I, I've got to get to the top. Oh, all of a sudden, I didn't know there was no top in there. i got to get to the top right away. Look at all the time that I have wasted. <laughs> so I've got to get to the top right now, well, just one day at a time, you know, get wherever you're going there. You remember when you were going to school about the, the tortoise and the rabbit there? He was kind of slow, but that rabbit, you know, he must have been alcoholic or something or other there. <laughs> And then again, we try to pull off this stuff on our people that love us. It's got to be my way or I can't stay sober. You know, you got to do it my way. Oh, shh. Got to walk carefully because poor dear Ned, you know, if you say this or do this, he'll get drunk. If he's going to get drunk, he's going to get drunk anyway. You can tread all you want to. If he's going to make up his mind to get drunk, he's going to get drunk. You know, things have got to go my way. I've got to have this back, that back. And the program has taught me first things first. Say, whatever God wants me to have. Yeah. We say, give us this day our daily bread, but Lord, I want peanut butter on mine. <laughs> and then we begin to say, well, you know, I wish I could want to stay sober. I wish I could want to. Isn't that a pitiful thing you wish that you could want to? And then, you know, we begin to criticize those that are. And let a person go out and have a problem. Oh, see, when a person goes out and have a problem, first thing I think about, wait a minute, you better take an inventory, Holly. Maybe you're doing some of them things too, so you better take an inventory. And then again, I must say, but for the grace of God, it could be me. Because there's nobody that's ever stayed in this program so long that they can't get drunk. I don't care how long you've been in here, you can still get drunk. They'll sell whiskey to me after 25 years just as quick as it will to somebody that's been in here one day. And one drink and they won't have to sell it, I'll steal the rest. <laughs> so as we travel on our journey into the Brady, we see this sign now, bumps and curves. You know? Humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. The little, little bitty things, bumps and curves. You're driving down the road and you see this little sign that says bumps and curves. Well, you figure, wow, well, that's a little bitty old bump, a little bitty old curve. I don't need to pay any attention to that. That's not very big. Well, you just try it. You wind over in the cow pasture, you know, bumps and curves. You know? and, and, you know, when I, I was going to school, they taught me in, in, you know, in Catholicism, catechism there, to avoid the near occasion of sin. Well, you know, I looked for the first occasion I could find. <laughs> Avoid the near case. So now I must avoid the near occasion of that first drink. Now I finally have learned to use those words for my benefit. Avoid the near occasion of that first drink. And one of them is pretend. Anytime that I pretend anything to be other than what I am, I'm in trouble. Really. Pretend. I cannot pretend that I am staying sober for me and I'm doing it for somebody else or in order to get what I want. Yeah. How we can pretend to stay sober. Oh, we just love it. You get your license back. You know? Same. Get it back. Procrastination. I have to watch that. That's another one of them bumps and curves, you know. You know, we say, well, you know, just as soon as I get my license back, I'm going to come to A. Well, but you walked a mile and it wasn't for a camel either. You know? Mm-mm. Well, and then here comes along the gals. So, you know, I, I tell you, I'm, um, just as soon as I get something to wear, I'm going to come to the program. But right now, I don't have anything to wear, you know, and, but I would come. Uh, what would you wear the night you did the strip tease? <laughs> or if you just got out of the hospital. Well, you know, uh, I, I would come to the meeting, but, you know, I've been in the hospital about 10 or 11 days, maybe 17. And i got to stay home and get reacquainted with my family. They already know you. You don't need to get reacquainted with nobody. Say, yeah. And then, you know, I'm going to keep on taking these pills, you know, and wake them up, shake them up, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I, somebody said, look, why don't you tell your doctor, don't give you them kind of pills. Well, I'm just going to take them, you know, till I get over the hump. Isn't that <laughs> Going to get over the hump. What hump? Well, pills. Sometimes you open a person's pocketbook, looks like an apothecary. And they feel in there. Well, you know, I just can't sleep at night, so I just have to take something to sleep. I get so tired of laying there counting sheep. Well, if you talk to the shepherds, you don't have to count sheep. <laughs> and then, you know, well, 
Another bump. Well, you know, I have a reservation. Maybe I'm really not an alcoholic. I have a reservation. I don't think I'm really an, you know, after all, then some of those people are just not on my level. Well, you spell the word level. It spells the same way backwards as it does forward. <laughs> Write it down and look at it. Level, you know? Mm-hmm. And you know, there never were any alcoholics in my family. And that a duck? Well, you break the tradition and be the first. <laughs> and then, you know, um, well, I don't need to go to those meetings now because, you see, I have my degree. Some amateurs have degrees, too. Some of them are red on them. That's what we need to do with some of these degrees if we're going to use them the wrong way. Yeah, right. And now, you know, after all, I've got a different job now. I don't need to go to AA. You know, he's been sober about three and a half minutes. And he's going to be a counselor? Because he's got a degree. He's going to straighten out lives. And he's only so screwed up. Walking around, he's looking for a desk to put his feet on, you know. Yeah. He's going to counsel somebody. He's been sober three and a half minutes only. Yeah. But he's got a degree. Mm-hmm. Well, I won't talk too much about that. I got told about that once before, but I'm still going to say it. (laughs) The big book says make sure your own house is in order. Says so in the book. You better make sure your own house is in order. Sure, we need counselors, and I think the best person on earth to counsel another alcoholic is an alcoholic as far as that's concerned. But bring it. Sure, the books is good. But what's the matter with relying on some of your own experiences? You know? There you go. Let's don't get too technical about this kind of thing. Mm -mm. Now let's look at 8 and 9. This man told me don't talk too long here. 8 and 9, when it comes down to amends. You see a sign on the road that says, Watch for ice on the bridge. That's when it comes down to making amends. You see, there's a very thin line between humility and stupidity, you know? You know? <laughs> no crawling. It doesn't say that. It says that we made a list of all persons we have harmed and became willing to make amends to them. made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Say, amends. Amends, we get that mixed up sometimes with restitution. See, restitution is made with the hands. Judge can make you make restitution. But amends is made with the heart. Amends. Direct amends. Again, make sure your own house is in order. See, See, I have to watch for that ice on the bridge. That Again, that is why I must. I'm not telling you to must. I'm telling me to must. Have a good spiritual foundation. For the simple reason is, we are people that cannot... Stand too much rejection. And you go out there and you're trying to make amends and somebody tells you, drop dead, and you damn near do it. Well, but if I've got a good, solid, spiritual foundation, I don't care what you tell me. Say, because God is not in my corner, I'm in his. You know, cross over to the other side. You know, sure there are certain things and certain people and certain places that I have to let go of. Yes. And then, I cannot get uptight too quickly. If I am rejected, I must remember that I too withheld love. I would too wanted to run the show. I have to remember all this. So when love isn't returned to me as quickly as it should, and possibly not at all, I must remember that I might very well have been the destroyer of it. Say. So here I am. But if I have a solid foundation, a spiritual foundation, the bottom will not fall out, you know. Things will fall in place. Now, as we travel on our journey into sobriety, we we are told here, continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admit it. We see a sign in the road that says, no U-turn, continue. Yeah. No U-turn. Now, along with that sign, you'll also see a sign that says, for authorized vehicles only. Now, that if you come in here and you think that you've had your 12 easy lessons in AA, you're an authorized vehicle. We will wait till you come back. (laughs) Now, just what are some of the things, what are some of the things that 
we may feel it gives us a right to make a U-turn. Well, there's sickness. You say, well, you know, so-and-so is sick or I got sick. I don't feel good, so I think I'll get me a few drinks that might would make me feel better. Well, then you're going to get sicker, you know. And you say, well, my dear mother or my dear whatever it is is sick, so I must take a few drinks because I couldn't stand to see so-and-so suffer. So you want to suffer with them, you know, one of those kind of things. Then there's many times we lose a job. Okay, no U-turn, lose a job. Sometimes stop and think about that job you lost. You, you, you know, maybe you want other people to think that you feel bad about losing your job. When really you tickled to death that you lost it. You just didn't have the guts to quit it. You know, and you, but this gives me an excuse to get drunk because I got fired. You wanted to quit anyhow, but you didn't know how to tell a man that you didn't want the job. You know. And then there's divorce. You think, oh, my gracious, I know I'm going to get drunk now. So-and-so is divorcing me. <laughs> and I've quit drinking and they're going to get a divorce anyway. Yeah. So there's other things you've done besides getting drunk. Thanks. So there we go. Just because, you know, you don't throw no silk blanket over no mule and make no racehorse out of him. Just because, <laughs> just because you're sober don't mean that that's all of it. You're not drinking anymore. There's other things. You see, you know, there's more steps than one. See, not no one of nothing is enough. See, we're told to get our teeth into the program, not tooth. One. See, one is not enough. You know, there's some people that have one eye. Well, it looks kind of dignified sometimes to see a person with one eye. You say, my, it looks rather dignified. You see a person with one arm. Well, that's a conversation piece. See a person with one leg. You say, well, yes, uh, rather dignified. is not he carry him or her carry himself well with one leg? But you ever see a man with one tooth, he looks like hell, don't you? <laughs> you don't look right with one tooth. Now this person says, get your teeth into it, even if you have to go out and buy some. You know? <laughs> and then again, here we come along. Well, well, what happened? Oh, I got bored. Oh, my gracious. Uh, well, I was going to AA, but, you know, I just got bored. Well, so what? A lot of us get bored with a lot of things, but you wouldn't go out and buy a stick of dynamite because you got constipated, would you? <laughs> okay. Now we see a sign in the road that says, Gas, food, and lodging. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact. Praying only for the knowledge of his will for, and the power to carry that out. Yes, food, and lodging. You know, that's a beautiful sign. And that's a beautiful step. That 11th step is a beauty. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious conduct. You got to know somebody before you can improve on, you know, your relationship with them, though. See, so two and three, you meet him, you know. So he knew you all the time, but you're just not meeting him. So, you know, but you can't get carried away with that sign that says gas, food, and lodging. Because there's always another sign that's right next to it that says, watch for fallen rocks. That's what people that's going to come along, you think you're doing real great, and somebody comes along and says, you know what I'm saying? You're just a bigger fool now than you were than you're drinking, you know? <laughs> I don't believe you have to go to all the meetings you're going to. Who you going there to meet? <laughs> watch for fallen rocks. Because they are there. See, I like to feel as long as I am in AA that I will constantly be in the recovery room. See, you and I have had one of the greatest operations that a person could ever have. See. And we, this operation could only be performed by the master surgeon. That's all. We have had a personality operation. See. And only God can perform this operation. Nobody else. I don't care who your psychiatrist is. I don't care who your counselor is. God performs the personality operation. And as long as I'm in the recovery room, they're taking my four vital signs. I can take them. Pride, fear, resentment, and self-pity. My four vital signs. And I don't need any intermediary to go out there and call a doctor. I can fall down on my knees and call a physician myself. You know? So. And that is what is so necessary to me. The recovery room. See? Even when them falling rocks hit me. You know? I said, Lord, you know some of us are sicker than others. <laughs> and sometimes I find out I'm the one that was the sickest. Yeah. And then as we travel on, we see this sign now that says, End of Divided Highway. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics, to practice these principles in all of our affairs. End of Divided Highway. Because there is merging traffic. This is telling me I can no longer have Two kinds of honesty. Divided highway. 
one kind of honesty, that's all. Merging traffic tells me I've got to treat to the best of my ability with God's help. People that are not in AA the same as I do people in AA. You come to AA and you sit around the table and you talk all night long and go home and won't speak to your family. You ain't got nothing to say. You walked out the door and you didn't say anything, sulking. Yeah. And as you get back in their home, you think, oh, hell, I was supposed to be mad when I left. I got to find something to get mad about. <laughs> but nobody couldn't shut you up around the table. Yeah. Talking about love and serenity and all that kind of stuff, and go home and ain't speaking. <laughs> End of divided highway. You know, one of those kind of things. So, because it tells me I must practice these principles in all my affairs. Not just my affairs at AA, and sometimes we've got too damn many affairs at AA. <laughs> that the book ain't talking about. You know? What are the principles? You know what the principles are. These principles were set down years and years before you and I ever came into existence. When God gave them to Micah. Love mercy, do justly, and walk humbly before your God. Thank you. Certainly have to thank Holly. She made up where I messed up. <laughs> right. How about that? Right. Now, uh, let me get this. I say, read, fool. <laughs> Women's clothes meeting will be here at three thirty instead of at the other hall. Also, the tradition play Friday night was taped, and copies are available along with all others. Uh, this meeting is being taped. Cassette will be made and speed copies at the rate of two per minute, 124 hours. Cassette will be available immediately following the conclusion of this meeting at the Borgia Hall lobby. Order blanks are available and you may order tapes for future delivery at the same location in Borgia Hall at times during the conference. On Sunday morning there will be an additional order station operating for your convenience. One in Robert Hall and one in the lobby at the East West Hilltop Dining Hall of the Garden Student Center. It is suggested that you obtain your tapes as the meeting proceeds as this is the only way we can meet the demand. Sorry, but no other tape is permitted by the university. Thank you for your cooperation. Our public relation policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need to always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and film. Man, I'd say, Betty, I'm sorry. Boy, what a print, and I do. Uh, now, would you all, all please... Jonathan Floss, friend. John Hansley. Now, 